So, um, a few of you sent me um, paper topics this morning. I'll write back to you later on this afternoon. Um, the rest of you have to make sure you get um, a proposal in for the secondary literature today. Papers are due one week from today. Um, and um, as I said, I don't know if you heard, um, you can email them to me, that's fine. Um, but there's some small risk in doing that because you won't see the physical copy that I will be grading. I'm going to print it out and grade what I have. Um, and don't anticipate any problems with that, but you might want to actually see the thing I'll be grading. Um, so that's fine. Um, otherwise, you can put it in my mailbox. Um, next Uh, one week from today. Uh, and I said I should reiterate um, no late papers. This, this is your extension. All right, last time we uh, talked a little bit about perspectivism. Um, <laughs> and um, I very briefly made the case that this is not um, a criticism of the idea of objectivity. It's a criticism of the idea of objectivity as a view from nowhere, um, as somehow beyond um, our human existence. Um, okay, and this was kind of a diversion, uh, but one that uh, we'll come back to in an important way later on. So section 13 then, on 85, he says, but let's, let us return to our problem. Our problem is the meaning of the ascetic ideal. Um, and he says, so I remind you what the ascetic ideal is. We're looking at various forms of it, but it is um, the um, valuing of asceticism, the view that the life of self-denial is the best life, is the most valuable life, is the highest form of living. And he says that, returning to our problem, he says, um, a contradiction such as, the ascetic, such as the ascetic ideal seems to represent life against life. This much, he says, is clear that that appearance of the ascetic ideal representing life against life is simply nonsense. He says it can only be apparent, that is, the contradiction here is only a surface appearance of what's really going on with asceticism. It can only be, this contradiction, can only be an apparent contradiction. It must be a kind of provisional expression, an interpretation formula, arrangement, a psychological misunderstanding of something whose actual nature could not be understood for a long time. So the actual, buried meaning of the ascetic ideal was hidden for a long time. It's only very recently that we are now able to see what's really going on. Uh, whose actual nature could not be understood for a long time, could not be designated in itself. A mere word jammed into an old gap in human knowledge. And to oppose this merely apparent view about the life being against life, with a brief statement of the facts of the matter, so this is really what's going on in a sort of condensed way, the ascetic ideal springs from the protective and healing instincts of a degenerate, degenerating life that seeks with every means to hold its ground and is fighting for its existence. It points to a partial psychological hindrance and tiredness against which the deepest instincts of life, which have remained intact, fight incessantly with new means and invention. The ascetic ideal is such a means. It's, the ascetic ideal is a means of life. It's a means of fighting for assertion. It's a way in which 
the will to power gets expressed. It's the way in which the will to power gets expressed in sort of a desperate try to express itself to exp so, sorry, uh, among the weak and degenerate. So the will to power, you remember, is the drive that we have to express our will on the world, to have the feeling of doing something, to have the feeling of powerful creation. And somehow, the ascetic ideal, Nietzsche is suggesting, is a way in which that feeling gets expressed sort of desperately in a last ditch effort, maybe, among those who are weak. The ascetic ideal is such a means, it is exactly the opposite of what its venerators suppose. In it and through it, life is wrestling with death and against death. The ascetic ideal is an artifice for the preservation of life. Okay, so although So although in one sense, asceticism is opposed to life, on its surface, the content of what asceticism says is self-denial. <coughs> Restricting your will, not wanting anything, being meek and um, passive and accepting and not being assertive or aggressive. That's what asceticism is. On the other hand, this Asceticism is a hidden expression of the will of power. Um, so, uh, like I said, it turns out that the ascetic ideal is an expression of, or is a response to, a fallen and sickly condition. So in the face of <coughs> sort of lifelessness, and sickness and death, the ascetic priest is actually uh, an attempt to what? To assert independence from those things. To separate off a person from those kinds of um, degenerating conditions. Um, so, at on page 86 of line 20, line 26, this ascetic priest, this seeming enemy of life, this negating one, precisely he belongs to the very great conserving and yes creating forces of life. Uh, a way of preserving and nurturing the will of power. And these days, at least, over in section 14, um, the greatest threat to human achievement and advancement are these apathetic, disengaged, weak, self-denying individuals under the thrall of the ascetic ideal, who see no point in trying to create anything, no point in trying <coughs> to make something of their lives. They've given up the idea that human life can be valued, that actually uh, accomplishing something here on Earth would be worthwhile. Um, so they sink into resentment and hostility toward the strong individuals who are actually willing things in the world, actually creating things, actually promoting and um, achieving, to, uh, achieving their ends in the world. Uh, and so there's a kind of nihilistic hostility toward them. Uh, I think it's important at this point to think carefully about 
who the strong and who the weak are here. Uh, we're no longer talking about physical power. Um, really what he has in mind here is something much closer to psychological strength, uh, much closer to psychological health. Okay, so 87, um, uh, line 13, broadly speaking, he says, it is by no means the fear of man who might uh, wish, sorry, it is by no means the fear of man one might wish lessened, for this fear compels the strong to be strong. In some cases, he says, um, terrible. Uh, he keeps the well-formed type of human upright. What is to be feared, as in these days, the larger threat, what has a doomful effect, such as no other doom, would not be for the great fear, uh, not be the great fear, but rather the great disgust at man. Likewise, the great compassion or pity for man. Supposing these, that these two should mate one day, then immediately something of the most uncanny nature would unavoidably come into the world. The last will of man, his will to nothingness, nihilism. And this, skipping down to 25, um, uh, and this, he says, is the great danger. The diseased are man's great danger. Not the evil, not the beasts of prey. Because of the beasts of prey, the ones that the moral system of values designates as evil, are the ones who are, what, strong, powerful, exerting their will to power outwardly on the world. That's not the primary threat that we face today. Those who, are the, uh, those who from the outset, are failed, <coughs> downcast, broken, they're the ones the weakest are the ones who most undermine life among humans, who most dangerously poison and call into question our confidence in life, in man, in ourselves. Um, where, we might, where might one escape it? That veiled look from which one carries away a deep sadness, that backward turned look of one deformed from the beginning, a look that betrays how much a human speaks to himself, that look that is a sigh, if only I might be someone else. Thus sighs this look, but there is no hope. I am who I am, how could I get free from myself, and yet I am fed up with myself. On such ground of self-contempt, a true swamp ground, every weed grows, every poisonous plant, and all of it so small, so hidden, so dishonest, so coy. Here the worms of vengeance, grudging, uh, vengeance grudging feelings team. Here the air stinks of things that are secret and cannot be acknowledged. Here the web um, of the most vicious conspiracy spins itself constantly. The conspiracy of the sufferers against the well-formed and victorious. Um, here the appearance of the victorious one is hated as evil. Um, okay, so here is for Nietzsche these days where the great danger comes from. It's the threat of nihilism. It's the threat of uh, simply passivity and giving up on um, striving to achieve an ideal. And uh, that nihilism spreading to infect the powerful ones who are able to express their will to power outwardly. Notice. That's these days, that's the threat, that's the problem. Notice that the powerful and strong can be dangerous too. Nietzsche is not dismissing that kind of uh, challenge or that kind of difficulty too. If they are powerfully and strongly pursuing improper ideals, that is, if they are pursuing values uh, that um, misrepresent uh, their object, if they